from my door. Just so, so if you don't want to be on the video, you'll you, you can you'll be seen if you're in the went in the doorway. <laughs> you won't be. You won't be seen there. I'm only going to be back here. Okay. All right. She's in her pajamas, but she won't be seen from where she is. Okay, I can so. just make it sure. Oh. All right. So, and usually at the end of this podcast that I do, I have um, like I have people if they're a live performer do a live performance. Do you feel like oh. you do something acoustically, like? I don't know. I didn't really prepare anything. I'd have to think about it. I'd have to think about it. I'm not really usually, I usually don't accompany myself. Okay. Even though I play other instruments, I, I it's something I don't usually do. Okay. Well, we don't have to do that. Um, I'm fine with that too. All right. So let's, uh, let's do this thing. Yeah. Ready? Um, so yeah. I do have to, I have to announce our sponsors and stuff too, but I'm going to do a great a idea. A little clap because I get paid, you know, I got to get paid. I'm going to do a clap. Clap. There we go. Um, all right. What episode am I on? I think 16. All right. Welcome to episode number 16 of the Songwriters Couch there behind me, uh, presented by my band, the Patrick Joan Band. And on today's show, I've got a special guest, one of my favorite musicians and uh, good friend and, and uh, colleague in the Recording Academy, Monica Ryan. Did I pronounce no. your name correctly? I know. No. <laughs> no, I didn't? Really? No. <laughs> it's Monica. Oh, Monica. That's right. Okay. So, Monica, uh, Ryan, I always, I, I usually check before I uh, announce anyone, too, that, uh, you know, that, that I have on the show. But um, on the show today, Monica, Ryan, and uh, why don't we, we kind of tell everyone what you do and, sure. uh, you know, any selfless or a selfish self-promotion uh, well, where they can find, you know, you on the, the internets and all that. Well, thank you so much for that great introduction. That was very sweet and the feeling is mutual. Um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a jazz artist and I do reach out into other genres, but I'm primarily a jazz artist and i um, I can be found at Monica Ryan Music on uh, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. And I'm also, um, my website is Monica, M-O-N-I-K-A, Ryan, R-Y-A-N.com. There you go. And so um, one of the things that I kind of highlight on this is songwriting. And you are in the midst of, of songwriting, right? At the moment, uh, and recording an album or six or seven. <laughs> Right. <laughs> this is what happens with me. Um, yes, I write a song every day. Um, and I do that uh, partially because it's um, the practice. Well, mostly because the practice of doing it makes you better of anything. Right. Like whatever you do, if you do it, the more you do it, the better you get. And I um, recently was reminded of a book I read years and years ago called uh, Art and Fear, Art and Fear. And um, in that book, there was a study um, done of pottery, pot pottery students of potters. And half the group in the class was divided into um, a group that their whole job that semester was to make the perfect pot. One pot, the perfect pot. The other half of the class, it didn't have to be a perfect pot. They had to make the most pots. And that was their job. They had, so it was basically quality versus quantity. And the, they had to be viable pots. They had criteria. They had to hold liquid. They had to have a handle or whatever the criteria was. I don't know what the criteria was. They yeah. had the same criteria. Um, and uh, what ended up happening was the highest quality pots came out of the quantity group. Mm. So when you think about that, you get better at anything by doing it. Just even if you're not trying to be perfect, just by doing it all the time, you get better at it. And so I write a song every day, not to necessarily write my masterpiece, although we always hope. Um, but it's really just to be better, to get better, to improve. And um, 
because I curate an album, when you put an album together, it's a bunch of different songs. You're curating something. And, and usually there's a point and a purpose to what you're curating. You have some sort of a message behind it or some sort of reason to put those songs together. Like, it's not like I wrote 10 songs that have nothing to do with each other and I'm slapping them together on an album. I'm really thinking about like, well, what am I trying to say here to the world or to, um, you know, to what am I trying to give people? Yeah, and so, yeah, I batch them. And so then I end up with multiple. Oh, I lost your audio there, Monica. Oh. oh, there you go. You're back. You're back. You're back. But this is a good transition period. Let me just let me also just before I forget, because we talked about this right beforehand. I do got to thank our sponsors for <laughs> for making the show possible. Uh, and uh, Monique, can you just give me a little audio? Just talk. Just make sure I got you. Oh, still. Yeah, yeah. oh there you Morning. go. Okay. Yep. Yep. You're still there. You okay. seem a little quieter now all of a sudden. Oh, no. I don't know what happened. Oh, you sound good. Some mystery. Oh, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, keep it, whatever, whatever is there. You sound good. Whatever happened, know, it's good. Yeah, I don't know if it's switched microphones or something like that. So uh, what you just said, though, uh, is something that I actually talk about a lot on, on this podcast with songwriters. Um, and there's a quote by, uh, I, I had mentioned this in a previous episode, by I think Eddie Vedder. And he said he, he was talking to one of his painter friends, and he was just starting getting into painting or whatever. Um, and he was terrible when he first started doing it. Um, and his painter friend who's like a professional painter is like before you judge on whether or not you're a good painter paint a thousand of them and then right. see whether right. or not, whether or not you're good and i think that um the combination too eventually comes of you know you've you've probably written so many songs at this point that you have um you've kind of gone through the the you know thousand pots uh that are a little leaky right uh and gotten yeah. to a place now where you can actually consciously decide on um you know making that that song or or that pot if we're we're trying to be uh you know metaphorical um <laughs> yeah. you have yeah, some conscious decision making over like how that product's actually going to come out but that's only because you've you've done it you know a thousand times let's say uh, or a million times or whatever the amount of um practice that you've done uh is yeah. is it a conscious decision to like write a song a day um no matter what that yeah. is if it's a viable song or not that's that's yeah you know I mean, I'm at, I guess I, I, as somebody who's improved, I usually can spin out a viable song every day. Like it's, um, then there's the piece that, you know, what is the arrangement? Like it, it doesn't have to be, it's not, they're not all six minute songs, nor really do I want them to be six minute songs. If I were a classical artist, I might have a different structure in mind, but, um, you know, as somebody who, it is did you hear that there's like a motorcycle going yeah yeah i'm oh, sorry <laughs> we're real we're real people here this is an ai that's that's how you, yeah. you hear the background noise is going on <laughs> yeah as as somebody who um you know is is making like songs to play on the radio or on uh, in in playlists they're usually you know two and a half to four minutes five feels long is that typical in in jazz too like is is jazz held to that same kind of like radio friendly you know three it minutes used to not be time. now it is i think every genre is interesting and and in the in the age of i guess i w i want to say twitter but x in the age of like <laughs> the, the shorter 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 sound bite I, you know I, I don't mind elon musk but but really what what was the point of changing <laughs> keep it twitter keep the name twitter uh, it's, it's i don't know tweeting you know um, I I don't think I can we can yeah. waste any creative brain power guessing because we won't get there. We don't know what you in mind. It's that good. Um because now is it called Xing when you when you put up a, a tweet? Or I don't know. You call it tweeting? I gotta I, I don't I, I, do the Twitters that much. I I kind of just I, don't know. I stay off of that that platform in particular. I've got enough. But the idea is like these short, 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 shortened mediums like mm. TikTok and X <laughs> <laughs> so I think people's attention spans are diminished. Like, e and mine too. I mean, I'm a product of today too. I can sit and listen to things for hours and hours and hours. But if a song goes on long, I used to write six minute songs, no problem. But now if a song goes on, I can almost feel when we're approaching mm. 
three and a half minutes and I naturally close the song because it, it can feel too long, yeah. which is weird because I'm an open minded person. <laughs> <laughs> What's strange though too is because you have like podcasts like this, right? Which are kind of like long, longer format, um, you know, discussions and and that sort of thing that has kind of taken off uh, in the last few years. And yeah, you've had you have the reels, and we've talked about all that kind of thing too. Those super short, you know, thirty second um, pieces of media that get put out, and we'll, we'll maybe get into that a little bit too. And what if if you're even doing any of that stuff? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing enough of it uh, according to a lot of people that are telling me I should I should do more of it yeah. um, but I'm resisting it at every turn to to do more of that um, but like you have the ability to have these long form uh, podcasts you'd almost think like in the era of like the Spotify's and the digital media um, as opposed to traditional radio like longer songs or longer um, longer pieces of music in some way shape or form might be more prevalent do you, you know what I'm saying? So like a um, like a Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Yeah. Um, like more kind of almost uh, uh, storytelling, like whole, you know, um, whole almost like operas, so to speak, in pop music. I, I would think that that's, that would come about too, side by side with this like short thing that's happening, you know? Um, but I, I don't, I think there's actually a reason, like I think there was originally a, business reason why they got sh why music got shortened mm. um i do i believe and i could be wrong this could be perception only but it was it's been my perception that um in order to get you know more plays on th things like spotify mm. they mm. want shorter songs so they want it's easier for them to get for people to get songs in playlists that are shorter. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. Um, maybe they want to have a fast turnover because of people's attention span. I'm not sure what I don't not sure what's behind that. But I have heard and observed that there's a shorter there's a there's a shorter length that's become like standard now in art you don't have to follow standard at all it really depends what your mission is with a piece yeah like if your mission is to say something and that something takes seven minutes or 15 minutes nobody should stop you but if your mission is to like write a song that can be slid into the marketplace in a way where it you know, has the least amount of friction to get that piece of art or message out there to, to, to observe the sort of norms of yeah, what the market, of what people are doing will give you less friction, less friction. Yeah. I almost, um, you know, there's something to be said about, all right, you want the most amount of ears maybe listening to your music, especially, and I think you and I probably think of music in a different way than some other uh, people out there, or musicians out there that are producing specifically for things like TikTok and, and you know, ad, uh, I guess, ad space <laughs> on, on these the social media platforms. Like we're coming at it kind of from an artist point of view versus it just being, uh, a business venture where you really don't care about the music. It could be split up and changed and, okay. and whatever. And, and, you know, you don't care as long as you're getting paid from it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that it's almost like a, um, almost like an old, um, like a, like an, uh, not an old way of thinking about it, but like, a uh, the, the way that music was 20 years ago and, and in the past versus 20 years, to now the way it's been commoditized in things like streaming um, yeah. and the like, where it really is like, it was always a product, but I feel like now it's, it's like you said, the attention spans are shorter. And so in a playlist, you know, I've seen songs that are super popular, but in a month th there's some other song. So you don't have like these classic, like a Bohemian Rhapsody or, a, um, you know, the songs that are still getting played today from, you know, back in the seventies, sixties, eighties, whatever, um, that are these classic songs that just get played over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, Rick Beato had, um, he's from, from Rochester actually here, I think. Um, he, um, he, uh, uh, talked about in one of his podcasts, a, like the billion plus 
streamed music or whatever it's all like acdc queen like it's all these you know the classic rock uh songs from back in the day that that like took the time to really write a piece of music versus something that's just going to be played over and over again at, you know every 15 seconds uh on almost like a loop you know well those songs also have a couple of big advantages on new songs i mean one of which is they had support a long time ago and they've become part of our cultural vernacular. So people are used to them and comfortable with them and like them. New things are not as comfortable, even you know, not to say that those w weren't, um, you know, totally revolutionary in their time. They were, but they had the support of the machine and a different machine that wasn't so short attention span, as we were saying. And, now they're part of the comfortable landscape. New stuff is oftentimes not comfortable to people. I mean, when you think of like things that are innovation, innovated, innovated or innovative, um, they are challenging what has been. And so there is some discomfort in, do I like this? It's like tasting a new thing you've never tasted. Or do I like this? This, this, you know, it, is this amount of sour or this amount of bitter or this amount of salty good or bad? I'm not sure. So we have this kind of, um, this kind of thing where something new takes time to settle in. And in a, in a time where there's not a whole lot of, it's a fast paced marketplace, like a lot of, um, you know, publications will not write about a piece if it was put out six weeks ago. That's mm. old. So you have, um, I mean, I was just talking to a, a newspaper who, you know, a writer, a music reviewer for an international newspaper, and they've reviewed my stuff before. And they said, oh, we'd love to review your project, but it's been out for like at the time it was like for eight weeks and we don't do, we don't touch anything that's been out. That's amazing. Six weeks. So we, we don't, we can't have the support to make something comfortable yeah. that a queen had or an ACDC had because we live in a different world. We have to, it's like you have to make a huge splash and then just hope that it, you know, you sort of play. hooks into some people, like some people. It's a very bizarre marketplace. Yeah, and yeah. almost you have to sell your, I mean, you've always had to be a, a personality or an entertainer to some in, in some regard as a musician, you know, you have to be a personality kind of along with you doing music. Um, but I feel like back in the day too, and, and when you say support, what I tend to think about is the support of the record companies getting new musicians or new bands in there that maybe aren't fully at their peak of what they're capable of doing, but there's potential yeah. there. And the record company is willing to put the money into them doing music as like a full-time thing. Um, you know, they're not being expected to immediately be money makers. Like there was a certain level of like, okay, we're going to invest a little bit. They'll put out their first album. Their second album will be better by the third album. You know, they'll, they'll grow as artists. And those, those are the albums, you know, like if you look at like Aerosmith, um, although that, that one Aerosmith song is huge. Now I have a story about that. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. People have no idea that that's Aerosmith, including my, uh, my producer, uh, Allie. <laughs> At one point I had to tell her because I was playing it. I was playing a, a thing of that. And she's like, why are you playing that TikTok song? I'm like that's Aerosmith. Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> But like, like they had some time, like Aerosmith's first album, although I really like it because it's so raw and whatever, you know, they didn't fully become Aerosmith, I'd say even until like Toys in the Attic or, yeah. or you know, Pump or the, the later albums where it was like, oh, now they're, they're a band. They found their groove. Right. Um, and yeah. I feel like artists nowadays don't have the luxury of, of time to grow into what you know, what could be amazing stuff because it, it's got, it's got to sell right now. And like you said, in six weeks, that song's old news already. So if you're not putting right. out constant, you know, constant, uh, content, um, it gets lost. I, I, and I don't know if that's me just being an old, old musician, you know, uh, complaining about the way things are now, but I think that like we lose something in that, you know, do you, do you feel that way? Or do you feel like we just have to adapt and, and maybe it's a new world that's, you know, there'll be new innovation that that comes out of it because it's, you know, you're forced into this shorter time frame to produce stuff. 
Well, I mean, I, I've never had a major label contract, so I'm not exactly sure how it currently works today. Like, um, they might have a system for developing artists that I'm unaware of. Uh, that's possible. I've seen um, artists that were smaller grow over the years uh, that have major labels um, recently. Hmm. But um, and and seen them develop. I've seen them develop into bigger, more you know, more polished versions of themselves. Um, so that that system may exist. It's still a little bit of an enigma to me because you see people who you know burst out of the gates with their first record, and it's you know all of a sudden the biggest thing ever. Um, that's different to me. But I don't know. It's like an iceberg. I don't know what happens. Un I don't know what's happening under the water and for how long. Yeah. yeah. You know? So I feel like I can't speak to the fact that it might it might be there just in a different form, you mm. know, in like a hidden form almost. Yeah. I, um, I see, workshopping I, something. Yeah, I, I see. It, but I see like the like so like, for instance, Billie Eilish um, or um, uh, Tyler, the creator, or you got like um you know artists that kind of put out their own independent stuff one of their songs cardi b you know uh, she was on a reality show and then you know because she had a little attention she put out you know almost rap is like a i feel like like she was kind of putting it out like eh, whatever i'll just do this for fun um and she ended up then becoming a you know a huge huge star based on the popularity that already existed and i feel like record companies now are swooping in kind of after the fact of artists building their well Possibly. I mean, I, I, I think I heard somewhere that Billie Eilish's parents are in the music business. I would have to look that up, yeah, that but it, I think a lot of, some... a lot of people, um, it is actually, I think, I think the, the narrative of this person just, you know, popped up like this out of the blue is a disservice to developing artists that at any age, because being good at anything, as we started out with the started out the 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 podcast talking about it, you have to develop. You know, nobody, nobody, no flower is just shows up full bloom. You know, you have to it has to get its way out the, from the seed through all of that hard soil, you know, grow, sprout some leaves, be a tight bud, you know, and there's all this process involved. And when by the time we're ooing and aahing at this gorgeous rose, it's been through a journey. Right. And that's true with all uh, all artists. They don't they're nobody springs forth done. Yeah. So this sort of narrative that, oh, yeah, just a couple of kids in, you know, with no resources, figuring it out and boom, they're an overnight sensation. It's 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 not um, it, it's not fair to any developing artist to put that image out. It's not real. Yeah. And I think that that with Billie Eilish, too, and, and her brother. Um, you know, they did have support of a record company kind of uh, early on in that, you know, that first record that that blew up. Um, and her, I think her parents actually were just like, like they were in commercials or something like that wasn't really a big music. Yeah. Thing. And she's super talented. I well, love maybe that. she is very talented. So is he. Yeah. And I, the thing is, I don't begrudge anybody their success. And they yeah, I think it's beautiful music. What kind of um, I guess what kind of bothers not. I don't want to say bothers me a little bit. Like I think is a, uh, like you said, a disservice. I think to the artists themselves sometimes is if they have one of those uh, things, they put out a YouTube video of some song, you know, kind of was written quickly. It blows up really big and they haven't done the thousand, you know, to get there yet. And it kind of just blows up. Right. And then they're under enormous pressure to just put out another product like that tomorrow um right so they can get trapped in this like um you know and you see it with with really great musicians sometimes in the pop world where it's like they're forced to just turn out the same song almost in a different way every single time because they have to sell um and it's not given the opportunity to really like spread spread its wings and and become something more than what that original thing and as if they if they don't 
do that on the kind of sophomore uh, piece of you know art that they release then they get free oh they were one hit, one hit wonder even though they were just the biggest star you know three weeks ago <laughs> they're like oh that's that's we're done with this person now you know let's move on to the next uh the next hot thing you know um and i i don't know i i feel like uh, uh like maybe it's 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 becoming such a commodity in the the TikTok world and all that, that it's losing its, its art in some sense. Um, aside from like what I see in the underground, like I see a lot of underground musicians doing a lot of cool stuff, but they're doing it without any expectation of, of well, there it is. Yeah. Um, There it is. I mean, the thing is, is that listen, the human experience is people are gonna try and label us as human beings from like, you know, just talking about all things human, in society people are going to try and label us and we have to say whatever that's your opinion you know yeah. <laughs> only person who defines me is me sorry yeah. love you um, and i think that's true as an artist as well i mean you it's the same thing you would apply to somebody saying i don't like your outfit you'd say good for you go dress yourself <laughs> you know like you know no one ever says that about me i wear the same thing every single day same, same the, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know my point is like you know no, I, get, I, I get made fun of constantly Monique. do you constantly yes well that is actually <laughs> their problem <laughs> not yours point and laugh look at him look at him no they don't do that I'm just, <laughs> but speaking of of you being uniquely you how did you what what got you into the genre of of jazz of all things as a, a musical genre that you kind of primarily uh sit in um and like what what got you into music in the first place i always like to see like where you know where the where the music reality. comes from yeah like you had in your family you have uh, a lot of musicians or is it no no it my family are all visual artists so oh. i i'm the oddball i'm the one that is the musician um yeah actually you know i would say my sister, I don't like, I don't even know what her taste in music would be. And my mother is still defining her taste in music. <laughs> and my father, you know, liked classical music, but you know, I wouldn't say he was much of a music fan either. Huh. Um, but here I, I am. And when my mother will tell stories that, um, <laughs> well, I was born, but seriously going that far back, um, she would give my sister, who's four years older than me, uh, a crayon and a piece of paper, and my sister would draw with it. She'd give it to me, and I'd be hitting the paper with the crayon or crumpling it up next to my ear. And it, it, Or another thing is, my, you know, my big sister really didn't want me hanging around her door, and I really wanted to hang out with my sister. So my mom would have to get me to do something else. And like, you know, like the cat that wants to be in your room that sits right outside, I would sit outside my sister's, crawl on baby, sit outside her door and hope that she was going to go exit so I could be with her, right? So my mom knew which my favorite records were. And when that was happening, she would put on a favorite record of mine, a crawling baby. And I, immediately I would perk up, crawl over to the speaker and sit next to it till the record was over. Huh. So I was always sort of governed by sound and sensitive to it. So what, but, um, what ended up getting you into, you know, playing like performing and songwriting, especially like, was it, were you trying to write the soundtrack to their visual, uh, visual arts or what was the. <laughs> no, I mean, I was always making up little songs as kids do. I mean, not really thinking anything of it, but just sort of making up songs. And I, I begged my parents to play the violin I begged them. And um, I did. My father found, I grew up in Manhattan um, in sort of right around the corner from CBGB's and my parents were split. So my dad had a place in the Lower East Side in Alpha, Alphabet City and my mom was on Great Jones between the Bowery and Lafayette. So right around the corner from CBGB. Hmm. And um, I, my, I wanted a violin so bad and they were like, no, no, no. So then eventually my dad on the way home was passing some somebody with their a blanket with all this stuff spread out that they were selling you know, along Tompkins Square Park. And there was a violin with a big crack in it. And he bought it for me. And that's when I started playing violin. So I was about seven. Did you 
just pick it up and start playing it? Or was it something you, you ended up taking lessons or? or I took lessons. I took Suzuki lessons. Okay. And um, I did that for a little while. And then I got to an age where, you know, I didn't, didn't really want to practice, but it didn't mean I wasn't musical. I just didn't want that structure of, of that kind of practicing. And, um, you know, I always watched old movies as a young child and I, the old movies like 1940s, 30s, 40s, 50s have the jazz, have jazz as their soundtrack. That was the music of the time. So I, I, you know, zeroed in on that, on those movies and got that sound in my, in my psyche. And I think I'm a sort of a, a romantic person by nature. And that music is very romantic, very heart driven. Hmm. And so um, the combination of the sound palette and also where I grew up, there was like a jazz club everywhere. I mean, I would pass the village gate on the way to elementary school. The blue note was on my block, you know, like <laughs> that Tuesdays was across the street or right around the corner from my high school. Like all these jazz clubs you know, with all these jazz greats playing in them were in, in my neighborhood. Yeah, that's Probably definitely not. something I miss kind of being upstate and, and, and surprising because the Rochester uh, has the uh, the Xerox, the International Jazz Fest up here. Um, so you would think there would be a lot of like jazz, you know, jazz bars and what have you up here. There's there's one or two, but not not like in New York. You know, I grew up in, in Queens, too. So uh, I hung around the same those same areas yeah. a lot when I was a teenager and stuff and including CBGBs. And what's funny is um, I ended up going to uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Ohio. Oh, I've been there. And they have the, I don't know if you know, I don't know when they got it in there, but the awning, the front awning of CBGB oh, on the first floor. And I, I walk in, I'm like, oh, that's, that's the, funny. The awning. so weird to like see it in a, in a museum. You know, I just spent so many yeah. evenings. Uh, and it was so like, counterculture, right? Yeah, and right. here in the museum, that's how it goes. Did you ever go to the, <laughs> the gallery next door, CBGB's gallery when that was open? Yeah. Like, the kind of side to it, which is a weird time frame where it, like it, it was like punk rock to like, okay, now you have this acoustic version of it on the. Yeah. it. W I think that was kind of the beginning of CBGB's end. <laughs> yeah, it was. It definitely was. Yeah. I was really surprised that, that New York city didn't like landmark it, you know, and say like, this is, this is a, a cultural, like, you know, something or other that they let it just be bought and, and, you know. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's happened with so many things. New York is like, it's, it's amazing. And it has these sort of periodically has these tragic closings. Like, well, how did that happen? Yeah, you yeah. know, but it, you know, it's like part of it. Cats. The circle of life, New York style. You know, <laughs> but it's so sad to see, like, when you grow up and and there's like these just these huge cultural things. They're like Cat's Deli. I just went went to try and get a, a sandwich that was down in New York. And I was like, oh, let's. Yeah. Actually, as a matter of fact, I think I tried to go there. We we're on tour. Uh, the last tour, I tried to bring my band there because they never had Cat's Deli sandwiches, right? So I'm like, oh, let's go. It was a huge line like around the block, but all around it, you know, it used to be, there used to be clubs and stuff around there, um, but now it's all yeah. just these high rise, like these huge high rise and then Cat's is sitting there like this, like all the buildings yeah. staring down like a, <laughs> their next Cat's Deli, you know, um, to be to be bought and turned into uh, some high rise condo. Uh, and the truth is, you don't know if that will happen. It's not like that'll never happen because that happens all the time, right? Yeah, you some... think, oh, it survived. No, it survived for now. <laughs> it'll become some virtual restaurant. You know, you can only get on Grubhub or something. Uh, You'll be able to go into some museum and see a diorama of it. <laughs> <laughs> of of Cat's Deli, a big pastrami sandwich. Little, yeah, a little, little <laughs> model of a sandwich that somebody oh. made. When you when you write songs, because um, you know you you obviously I see instruments behind you. You have a piano. You have your your bass back there. And I uh, I mentioned the the Jaguar back there too. But um, how do you approach songwriting? Is it is it something that you approach from like a a band, or do you typically come at it uh, writing sort of a beginning of a piece or something, or or how do you actually approach like coming up with your, you know. I, okay, coming up with like the like the musical structure or the lyrical structure or both or like either both yeah because usually when I so I'll give you an example when I write a song typically I'm 
sitting somewhere. I just have my guitar in my hand. I'm either having a drink of alcohol or um, I'm just sipping coffee in the morning and I'm just playing around on my guitar. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting thing. Or I have, you know, I start playing something and I, I come up with a line or a lyric and yeah. then I flesh it out from there. It like, kind of comes to me and then I have to flesh it out or remember. I've been talking about this. It's almost like I'm remembering the song versus it um, like come me. I like that. And a lot of songwriters I've talked to too are, are in that same boat. It's like you, it's like you're you're remembering what already exists somehow. Uh, I love it. And every other musician also kind of remembers it. So when you're in a band, they're like, "Oh, I, I," because this is the language that they use. Oh yeah, I can hear this harmony there. Or, oh yeah, I can yeah. hear this part of the song happening. Almost like like I said, it already exists in some capacity yeah like on another alternate like we're talking now we're in qu the quantum plane <laughs> <laughs> but like usually um it starts by me you know sitting on a guitar i'll play a couple of chords and i'm like oh that's, that's an interesting you know progression and then i'll start to write lyrics and sometimes it comes easily sometimes i start writing and spend a lot of time on it, and it's i end up giving up on it after a while because i feel like it's garbage um and then my band yells at me i really Dad. like that song Forced, don't give up forced to play it over and over again for years and years even though i don't like it um yeah <laughs> but like how do you approach the songwriting because you're saying you you write every day so do you sit I do. to write or is it something you're just kind of you're hanging out you're by your piano and you're like um oh. i um i almost never am just hanging out and and it comes like that. However, when I do, it's almost like I turn on a faucet or a switch. Like yeah. I go, okay, now, now I'm going to do it because but I, I, uh, I have, have a very fluid schedule, but it's a very full schedule. Like I'm working all the time. I work seven days a week yeah. and I have two teenagers and, um, but mostly they're of the age where they do a lot by themselves. So it's, even though I'm very, very busy, there and I'm I'm very present mother, and that's a part of my schedule. Most of the time, I'm actually working on music, and um, because I'm so busy, sort of arranging this record and that record. When I go to songwrite, when I go to write a song, I stop doing what I'm doing, or I t I'll tell my children like, okay, like if you need anything, tell me now because I'm going to song. I like I turn it on. Mm. Um. And then I, I use, well, I'm actually not the world's greatest instrumentalist because, well, who could say they were, but I'm really not. <laughs> and if they could, would they? Um, anyway, um, I'm really not because every time I went to practice uh, whatever instrument I was holding, I would end up writing a song. Hmm. So I like I would start an exercise and all of a sudden isn't I I forgot about the exercise and I'm writing a song. Right. So I never I developed one thing and not the other, actually, um, just following what I was interested in. But that's a whole other side side quest. Um, I usually start with a baseline, usually. Mm -hmm. And for a specific reason is that. The bass to me is the heart of the song. It is one foot in the rhythm and one foot in the harmony. It's really the heartbeat of the song for me. Um, because if you have a clear bass identity, you have the song's identity. So I, um, I sometimes will write a, a bass line that's almost a melody. Um, because it's telling me what the song is. So, and then it really does define, like it, it once you, that, if you, if you start with that minim minimal piece, you will know what the rest of the song is supposed to sound like. Like it, it's because of the nature of that instrument. You can, I, so I, I tend to write very, um, I'm in the same boat music like musically from a, a technical standpoint i think i'm a better songwriter than i am an, a technical musician and my bandmates can probably uh, attest to that oh. as i ask him what, what, what fucking key is this and I, I wrote the whole song you know i'm like i don't know what key this is i don't know what chords i'm playing sometimes because i'm my fingers just you know are doing something you know what it sounds like and you like that 
right? It sounds good, and it, it, there's a place yeah. for it, whatever. But I like to write lyrically, um, kind of sto- almost stories to the song, and have it have a a, a general feel, and then I, I flesh out the musicality behind it. Um, but I feel like jazz is written almost in a in a different way, where it's written from the musical part of it, and then the lyrics are kind of something that gets added almost after the fact, or or not, um, not after the fact, not an afterthought, but like. Um, um, like there's a melody to it that fits in with the 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 jazz of it all. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah. And, and the storytelling is kind of like almost like a because there's a lot of scat singing in jazz and there's there's things like that where almost lyrics are almost like a secondary um, thing. It's not necessarily storytelling, although it is um, like do you- I think it depends. It depends. I mean, I'm often doing this, the lyrics sort of simultaneously. Hmm. You know, I say I start with the baseline. I do, but I'm also thinking kind of like almost parallel, like train tracks of what the song's about. Because there's the sound. It's it, it's it, that is the part that's a little bit more mysterious. Like like I like starting with the baseline because I like the uh, receiving the musical identity that way. Like figuring that part out but i pretty pretty quickly know what the song the because i know what it's about because of the baseline i pretty much know what the where the lyric is gonna be yeah so like what, what the i think the previous one to previous podcast to this i had a, a, a gentleman by the name of uh um looking up my book marty a, a, i mispronounced his last name too a, lo, a loco I, i'm probably mispronouncing i'm so bad about names um but like so he's he was talking about this thing he used to do because my daughter maya wrote recently he, he was he was her guitar teacher for a little bit right oh, cool. like me teaching her it's less structured and it, it doesn't feel like no it's hard it's hard so I, I wanted to hire a a, um, uh, a teacher. So he he was part of the Rock Academy thing. Uh, Elvio uh, Fernandez from Daughtry has a school up here. So the piano. Oh, cool. Daughtry. So she was going there, and he was he was the teacher. But um, she wrote this song recently that was all melody. Like she had this melody in her head. She recorded it. I I got her like a little scarlet thing, a microphone for her room, and all that. She recorded nice. it to a cl- you know to a click, and all, I'm like record it to a click so I can go back afterwards and I can do stuff with that, right? Um, cool. But she she Good wrote life, it still. not from how I normally write, where I'll have some sort of a rhythm guitar thing, right? A chord progression of some sort that can be either translated to piano or kept on guitar or whatever, and then I write a melody over that or I remember the melody over it. Um, uh, but she wrote it from a melodic point of view. And then I had to go back in and try and fill out the music behind it. And I yeah. think he like almost impossible for me to do. But the reason I bring huh. up Marty is because what when I had him on the podcast, I was talking talking to him about this. I'm like, you know, I, Maya had just wrote, written this song, this melody, and I'm trying to come up with the music behind it and talking about it being challenging. He's like, it's funny because what I used to do uh, is like, people would put up on TikTok or YouTube shorts or whatever, um, these things where they would sing melodies and then ask people, hey, put put something to this or, you know. Let's- yeah, that's actually my favorite TikTok thing. I don't like TikTok, but I love it when you see people build out yeah. how something would be. I just, so very fun. He had, built, he had done this so many times where he would write like background music to just some kid, you know, coming up with a melody on TikTok. Right it was that he had gotten very doing a thousand of them right he had gotten very yeah at like writing the background music to uh, a melody that's there and so yeah so we sat down afterwards and he figured out like a little thing and came up with the progression you know for it and we ended up writing it um but i feel like the reason i, I bring that up is because i i have uh, uh skill sets i guess that i'm good at um which is the songwriting part like you reminded me of of me too. Like from a musical standpoint, I've got, it's in my head in some way, shape or form, but I don't have the technical prowess of like a really great technical, like keyboardist or a, you know, a, a, a jazz. But you keyboard. don't need that. That's the thing. Okay. So one of the I'm, things I I'm learned. good at songwriting, but, but yeah, musical technicality is definitely not my thing. And I need to, but that could be to your benefit. Cause I'll tell you, 
I'll tell you, sometimes being a novice at something, you see things in a different way. Not that you're a novice. I'm not calling you a novice songwriter, but if you're talking about like technical stuff and saying that's not my thing, you're going to be looking at it in a different way than the technical person. Right. And right. so you'll, it's as novice isn't the right word, but it does apply to, I guess, if somebody's looking at something for the first time or just from a different side, you'll have a different um, perspective and that will make your work refreshing. I mean, so I heard that um, Joni Mitchell suffered from polio as a child and left her hands weak. So she couldn't play guitar in standard tuning. She had to play in, you know, open tunings. Um, and so with her weaker hands, she on open tunings was doing what she could do and created all this beautiful music that was different because her limitations were guiding her. Hmm. When you think about your limitations, I mean, we all need like if we have the structure, if we have no structure at all and no limitations at all, we can be overwhelmed by the options, like too many choices, right? I uh, another thing that I'm that this is reminding me of is I read this book by Twyla Tharp, who is a famous um, choreographer. Uh, she choreographed Hair on Broadway, and um, she's choreographed many things. So far, anyway. I think my my uh, oh no hairspray my my daughter's doing hairspray this year ah uh, different totally different uh, but um, but uh, I think I read somewhere in the book I, she was talking about a, some project she did where one of the dancers was in a wheelchair and actually having that limitation basically helped her define what the dance would be because there you there are certain things you can't do with a wheelchair what can you do oh but you can do things people can't do because you can involve the wheelchair in the dance you can be doing wheelies and things and you can be doing different things that so this limitation is not a limitation it's more like um it narrows the options so that you can sort of get the precision for that right piece. So I think limitations are helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I've 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 actually talked about that too. So like for instance when you're when you're a young musician especially in New York City, right? And you you've got your your apartment there and for anyone living in New York City that may be watching this um that grew up there, you know, you have your first apartment, it's super expensive. You're you're you know, if especially if you're a musician, you're trying to make it as a musician, so you're playing music, you're probably working some crappy, you know, wait wait waitering job or your yeah. coffee you shop or it, whatever. Right? Um but like buying new strings for me was always like a, a cost that's like oh, I can't buy new strings. So I sometimes I'd have a guitar laying around but it would only have like four strings left on it because I had broken a few. I play kind of hard sometimes. So I break a lot of strings. Um, but sometimes you break like the D string or the, the, the high E on it. And so it leaves it. it you can't play guitar like you normally would. And yeah. So, it's a different texture. Oh so yeah. So you end up coming up with, with stuff that maybe if you had those other strings there, you wouldn't be able to, or you wouldn't think to play in that way. Um, and yeah. so almost like by having the limitations of the, um, the constraints of, of poverty of a, <laughs> of a musician right. that can't afford strings actually opens you up to be more, uh, more creative or come up with, with, you know, to more, think differently. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, do, do you find like you put yourself in such I know you're saying, you know, you, you, purposely focus on okay i'm going to write a song have you ever purposely like put some court, sort of like constraint on yourself i mean obviously when making a record right you have a th uh, a um a theme to the record so that you're putting yeah. a theme on yourself in that that way um is there is there anything else that maybe you've done almost purposefully to put yourself i, I'm, in the I of, feel like i have but i can't think of it on this on the spot because this isn't something i thought about before this moment. I mean, but I feel like I have. I know that with the last album, I knew the title of the album before it was done. Same thing actually with my current album. What's, Nine what's next new album. 
Can, can you speak about <laughs> those yet? Any, any of those? Do you want to? Now I can speak about the next ones to a point. Yeah, mention to a point. maybe just so that if people are on the lookout for, you know. For well, the was. the last one was called playfully. So the restrict the constriction was I didn't want anything that was a downer, and I really didn't want any ballads, but I ended up with one. I wanted them all to be sort of have a sort of a lightness to it because the idea was about it. it that was a that whole album was a reflection. Uh, I had been talking to everybody last February, almost a year ago about, you know, how are you doing? How's life? And we had just all been through COVID and politics is crazy and there's war and all of these sort of devastating pieces of news and life experience in our psyches. Everybody was exhausted. Everybody felt like, oh my God, it's so hard to, I feel like, you know, I'm weighted down by the world around me and I just have to go and go and go and, you know, the price of milk and everything, right? So I wrote that whole album um, about, you know, with the thought in mind, uh, you know, when times are hard all around, the way we not just get through them, not just survive, because we were all surviving, but to thrive is through inner strength and being in touch with those spaces of joy within. When there's no joy without, of course, no, like people do have moments of joy. But when the joy, the light is dim outside, you got to boost your inner light, right? So my, um, the whole album is about ways to do that. It's about like, there's there, I see, I see that light in you. I have one that's called, I see it in you. And it's about, you know, all the sort of little magic things I'm seeing in you. And then I have, um, and the you being there, there, you know, the you being each individual. I mean, I do look for the, the light in people and I do see the things I was, calling out in other people. And sometimes people need to be reminded of that. So that was a reminder. And then little pieces of magic. And then there was a song called Slipping Out about setting boundaries and taking space when you need space. Like you can be, you. there's another song called Grow Where I'm Planted, which means sometimes you're in the heart of the action. Sometimes you're in solitude. Sometimes you're someplace you want to be. Sometimes you're not. And wherever you are, you can grow. And we do grow because the state of being alive is the state of growth. So it was sort of a reflection of all these sort of positive um, reflections that you can lean on to feel powerful and good and okay with taking time off and okay with the joy of missing out, um, you know, while you're getting your strength together. So, you know, there's, so when I, when I, theme something, there are natural limitations. Like that was themed. I wasn't going to do anything that was wailing or heavy, even though I, I write music like that. Sometimes it was not going to be on that album. <laughs> yeah. and, and the next one, uh, it, I, the one that I'm currently working on, I did not, I had less limitations on, um, because I recorded most of it. I recorded most of it in Spain in October. Hmm. I was going to Spain and my good friend Sergio is a great guitar player who is a Brazilian guitar player who used to live in New York, who now lives in Spain. And we have long been friends and fans and wanted to work together. Hmm. So um, we, I, uh, that one I hadn't, totally titled, but I wrote the music and I noticed that all of the songs four, like four of the songs are about getting away. <laughs> I really wanted to get away. <laughs> I really wanted to go on vacation and I did, and I recorded it on vacation and I'm still working on that. So then, um, anyway, I recorded nine songs in October and then brought, uh, piano play, a wonderful piano player in back in Spain and the bass player and the drummer on another day and recorded another three songs. And then I felt it still needed something. So I hired some horn players in New York and um, it's in, it's in like, it, I think I have all but one part done now and it, it'll be in mixing soon, but 
Well, I think that that too, in and of itself. So, so you got me thinking about about a few things because um, I, I think the majority of the songwriters and music, musicians I've had so far on the show, actually, fifteen shows. I don't think any of the my previous guests have had kids, right? And so you and I, right, are, are yeah in kind it's of a different ball game. Yeah, in a similar boat. <laughs> Um, but you, you got me thinking kind of a little bit about two things. One, as an independent musician, a lot of times you're funding, funding a lot of this yourself. So you're paying musicians, you're paying for mixing mastering, you're paying for this kind of out of the, the, either the proceeds of a previous project you did or, or out of elsewhere. And you're pulling kind of resources from wherever you can, cause you don't have the yeah. unlimited, um, uh, resources of a of a record company putting in a bunch of money uh, to make something happen and make the vision really and so you're you're naturally constrained by by some financial limitations um, right right but, and also uh, kids do need things too and so it's not like you're just earning money right. and it's not like you're just earning money and yeah. not finding it away and yeah, yeah, yeah. you got it. so like so so part of that is you know I find uh, and, and and, and I'd like to put this out there because I, I feel like if I'm going to put out a songwriting podcast or, or some kind of message about songwriting is that, um, you know, there's almost a compulsion on my part to do this. And I'm sure it's on, on your side too, right? To make music and to write songs and, and to do this sort of thing. And you can easily get put uh, or, or find yourself in a situation where, okay, I've got, I've got to take care of kids and I've got to, you know, I've got to provide, um, uh, this or that for them and they've got all their things going on and you can easily lose you know a part of yourself and become kind of like um i i feel like i end up not not being the best dad i can be if i'm not also doing the music thing too you know oh, like, yeah you know, gotta like, take care of your spirit like that's it, it like it can be difficult because it's tiring being a parent too you know to find like the time um which is interesting that you say you know you set a certain amount of time which is great and your kids know and you have obviously behind you you have kind of a little studio and we can't see the rest of it uh, but i think we're pretty it's like similar. a little attached shed it's not yeah. very big yeah, I mean, I've, I have, I've got a similar yeah. thing in my basement that I built, you know, a little studio and, and where all this stuff is, is there. So it's obviously such a, an integral part of like you as a, 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 you know, as a human being, but then you're also a mom there. Like, does that, do you find your kids um, either one, cause you know, you're part of the recording Academy. So you've been to the Grammys and all that sort of thing. And, and my daughter as well has come to the Grammys. And as a matter of fact, speaking of Billie Eilish, Big fan. She's a giant fan of Billie Eilish, or was at least the, the year that she won, like eight. Yeah. I'll tell this story because I, I haven't told this story actually publicly uh, ever. So I'll tell you this story, uh, Monique. And I don't know if I've told you this, but we go to this the 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 Grammys out in LA, and uh, on the way in, I'm looking at. I brought her with me, my daughter. Right. Yeah. So, looking at my phone, trying to pull up the information for the tickets. We're walking into what was then called the Staples Center to go get the tickets. That Friday, a Sunday was the Grammys. Uh, so as we're walking in, Beck is coming in uh, and he's got a yeah. whole security team around him, right? And I'm looking down at my phone and I accidentally like, like shoulder check one of the security guys that's like surrounding him. I'm like, oh, sorry. Um, and then I'm back down to my phone, but I got my daughter and she's, I think she was eight at the time. So I'm like holding her in the state. Yeah. It's all stuff, you know, so I'm being a parent. Yeah. You, too, yeah. Like, yeah. Figure out tickets. It's a busy space. Yeah. I get up, I get up to the, the line for the tickets there to, to grab our tickets. And, uh, the security guy comes up to me like, like angry, like ready to, you know, I know that feeling cause I grew up in New York city. I know the, yeah. the eyes of someone that's about to like, you know, I'm going to fight. Yeah. Uh, but he comes up like like steaming mad. Starts. Uh, Did you do that on purpose? But I'm like, no, dude. Like I'm, I'm just. I was looking at my phone. Sorry. Like I said sorry when I bumped into you. Like I wasn't trying to do anything. Anyway. Um. <laughs> so he leaves, and then uh, I'm waiting in in line because I'm with my daughter. I'm like, just you know, don't worry about that. Like whatever happened. Like he got mad. I shook his hand. That's what I did. I put out my hand. I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. Here's my hand. I'm not gonna fight you in the middle of you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Awfully. But then I keep seeing him like he's talking to someone off in the distance as I'm waiting. I'm moving up in line. He starts coming back. I'm like, oh, God, what's, what's going to happen now, right? He walks right. over. 
Um, I don't know if I'm going to end up getting him in trouble for, for putting this on a podcast, but he comes over. He's like, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you were there with your daughter. I, you know, I'm a father too. And I got, you know, I got kids. I just, when I'm in the, 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 you know, the mind space of being security, I'm very like, you know, hyper-focused and I get a little like tense or whatever. I apologize. He's like, here's my card. Um, when the Grammys come on, on Sunday, just, just shoot me a text. I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I appreciate that you apologizing or whatever and coming over. But my daughter um, was there and he's like, you know, if you, yeah, we'll get you backstage, we'll get you down towards like, you know, the, the A-list, you know, like, well, the best. and yeah. you know, you know, the Grammys, right? So like that, those seats aren't yeah. even purchasable. No. So I'm like, but, but he did it in front of my daughter. So now I have his card and my daughter, the whole, the two days. Before, <laughs> did, you, did you text him yet? Did you text him yet? You know, cause she wants to go up and <laughs> I'm like that day, you know, normally I wouldn't ask any kind of favors. Like, yeah, right. I'm cool with that. I'll, I'll go sit where, you know, where, where I bought my tickets. She was pushing me. So I text him that morning and he's like, all right, so I'll, I'll bring you down. Just text me when you're in the, th we get in there. He brings us down. I'm sitting next to the producer of the Grammys now. And I'm next to like Trevor Noah, like literally front row right there. Amazing. That's, that's the year that Billie Eilish ended up winning. Oh my God. Eight, right. She's eight year old eight-year-old little Maya sitting next to me, next to the producer of the Grammys. But she's, I'd never seen her scream like a teenage girl, but she was screaming like a teenage girl. <laughs> Billie Eilish won another Grammy, you know? Um, but it's funny because the reason I say that is because as a, as a parent, uh, being a musician, I think that kids, they don't realize what, like where, like I don't think she fully realized where she was, like that not many yeah. people get to sit front row at the grammys and watch yeah. you know this all happened so it's kind of in a way i was really happy that all that happened even though the way that it happened was kind of like weird but um i was happy that that happened because it lowered the boundary between um like she almost doesn't care about the grammys or the yeah. the like fame of things because she's become disconnected from it being not within reach if that makes sense. Yeah. And so no, I think it's good for kids to sort of know that everybody's a human being and we are all connected and, you know, you know, it, it's possible for them to reach any level they want to reach. Yeah, and like, that sort of demystified that it's not an us and them. It's just an all of us. Do, you, do your kids go into your studio and like, are they musicians at all? Are they really into music or are they like, they're oh, really oh. into music. Okay. Yeah. They're that. really, 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 and they have excellent taste. Um, I, I think they do anyway. Um, yeah, it's pretty fun. You know, my son is a really, really fine guitar player. Uh, okay. Yes, he's very, very good. But he doesn't uh, play to perform. He doesn't like to perform and doesn't want to pursue any performance in his guitar playing he really just plays for like the super pure love of playing but he plays it every day and um he's he you know gets into a record and he'll be copying it you know and just work it till he can copy it and um the latest version of what he was copying is like a, such a good record um it's I, I think it's one night in San Francisco. I live one night in San Francisco with um, John McLaughlin, Paco de Lucia and Al Di Miola. It's so amazing. It's amazing. I mean, the songs were written, but they also were largely conversationally improvised between them. So they're like this super fast picking back and forth. It's such a fun. It's like both, you know, virtuosity and humorous. You know, it like a good humored conversation, quick, quick quips back and forth. So he, you know, got into that album and just started copying all three of them and yeah. having the whole conversation himself. <laughs> yeah. well, well, that's kind of what I was getting at, right? Like that, that the musicality, I think of, of my daughter, like even just that, that melodic thing that she wrote is so significantly beyond where even I am today after doing music for, for 30 something years, because, um, she kind of grew up just in 
in music and I, I i'm just wondering like you having kids like is it is it, it there's almost like a disinterest in what i'm doing like she doesn't care at all some people are like oh that's so cool you're doing this or that she doesn't, oh, she doesn't care at all about what i'm doing i drag yeah. them in here to listen to my stuff because yeah. i know they'll tell they'll get they, like they have good taste so like you know my son will be loading he's going to be 17 in 10 days he'll be like loading the dishwasher listening to miles davis or like you know like he's got good taste yeah. and my daughter she plays bassoon with the philadelphia youth orchestra so she is um she has she has you know really good ears like and she'll listen to stuff and she'll be like, well, the over undertones are making it a hair flat, but it's not really flat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so so <laughs> I'll have them come in here and tell me what they think of stuff I write. And when they think it's cool, I know they've got like a whole library of information that they're, you know, comparing it to. Yeah. How, how do you come up, how do you like bring about the energy of creativity after kind of momming? Like, is there a, like, I'm obviously they're a little older now, right? But when they were younger, yeah. I would imagine it was, it was because, well, I wouldn't imagine. I know that when, yeah. when kids are younger, it's very exhausting. Um, and, and I had my ways of finding time to like be creative and, and ensuring that I was kind of in a state to be creative. Like, is there, yeah. is there something that you did in particular, like that kept you going with music? Um, Cause it can be something where when you become a parent where you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to get a regular job kind of thing and not, pursue the yeah. stuff anymore and and um maybe put that on the back burner and and but like you obviously continue to do it um successful. well i was i was fortunate in the sense that i was you know in a in a committed marriage and that my husband um made enough money for the family if you know we weren't going crazy spending money we had enough okay. And so I didn't need to go get another job. That was key. And um, because not everybody has that luxury, that's a luxurious position to be in. Yeah. Um, and I did have that luxury. But I also, uh, shortly after having my son, who is my older child, he, um, he, I had a couple gigs lined up, like really nice gigs. And I went to them, you know, one of them when he was three months old and was like, hmm, I, I want to be home with the baby. Like, I love doing what I'm doing, but I want to be home with the baby. And so I really did. I didn't stop making music. I just transitioned the way I made it um, when they were really little. Like, I did a lot of writing and playing music, but it was like it was really like a seed underground. I was just like my son plays now just for himself. I almost kept it in, but I would take the kids to early jam sessions, jazz jam sessions, like not the late ones in the CD bars, but the early ones that happen at dinner time in nice restaurants. Those, you know? definitely, those late night ones are definitely not kid friendly. I've been to a few of those. Oh. Lots of pot yeah. smoke in the air and, you know. <laughs> yeah, but there were a couple that were like, that were, you know, 20 minutes from the house and they were at dinner time and great jazz musicians were there and it, they were in nice restaurants and I could bring the kids and I could say, okay, you can have anything on the menu. And, you know, they paper, I remember this one had paper um, tablecloths. You can draw and we're going to sit together except when I'm singing one song. <laughs> <laughs> but they could see me and I could see them and I would get up and sing. And, you know, one time I remember my daughter was, she had to be, you know, two or three. And she, she decided that she did, she wanted to come up and I'm singing a song, some sort of jazz ballad. And I picked her up, put her on my hip and kept singing. <laughs> you know? so, and people love it, you know, and my kids remember it fondly, you know, they remember did you all of those like, things. like super comfortable on stage too because of that you think like nowadays like My kids? yeah are they think? comfortable on stage yeah I'll just, just um no no no, no. They te they're teenagers though now right or are they my daughter is now because because she has to for her bassoon like she plays in the honors wind ensemble in the high school um and she's in this 
orchestra, um, the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, and they're playing big rooms. Like they're going to be playing the Kimmel Center, which is like huge. It's like Lincoln Center yeah. in yeah. Philadelphia. Um, so you have to get comfortable. And their rehearsals are like, their rehearsals are practically a performance because <laughs> there's like, I don't know how many are in the orchestra, but it's basically a room full of kids playing their instruments and the conductor and the orchestra staff. So it's like a performance, even when you're practicing with each other. So she's getting, she's more comfortable now, but you know, she'd probably be nervous if she was stepping out just her in front. Yeah. Yeah. Being out there kind of front. Cause you're, you're the, the lead vocalist, right? Typically when you go out and perform, like was that yeah. something to, you kind of wanted to be out in front or is it something where, cause some, I'm the lead vocalist too in my band. And sometimes I feel like I want to sit in the audience and watch my band. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. But, but, but it needs, um, it needs someone to kind of lead the, the charge a little bit, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an important role. So, I mean, everybody's got their role, right? So they're all important. Yeah. I, I I'm just interested in like a, another parent's perspective on, cause, cause similarly, I mean, when my, when my son was born, um, like I had this thought of, okay, I can, I can stop playing music. Right. Cause it, it would be, um, not necessarily easier i guess it would be yeah it would be easier because i, I yeah it, on some level easier on other levels harder like externally easier internally harder <laughs> I, I had a day job and all that stuff doing you know that, that was providing the uh you know the health care and all that kind of thing and, and yeah the main source of income and all that but i was like i can stop playing music but i don't want them to look at me and say like i kind of had a conscious decision I want my kids to know that you don't have to to give up on what you love just because you have a family and you have, you know, you have. Yeah, that's important, like actually. In, a, in a, a relationship, like there should be people like uh, you should be supporting each other and everyone should kind of be um, helping each other do what what makes them happy, regardless of what, you know, I guess what that is. Um, and I kind of feel, felt like I needed to be an example of, um, you know, like I said, just because you get married and you have kids, you don't have to all of a sudden give up all your, you know, your creative endeavors and all that. You can do that, too. And it takes some ex a little extra effort in that instance. Um, but the conscious decision to do that, I think, was in I, I'm seeing it now almost like impactful on them um, because yeah. I, I see them, like I said, my, especially my daughter who's in the creative space. My, my son learned a whole bunch of instruments. He's super talented, but he had no interest in performing at all. Like ah, just, same. Interesting. Like, play the saxophone, <laughs> drums. Like, like he's musically, he can, he can do all of it, but no interest in it. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I find it interesting, like, like parents especially, that, um, you know, that, that continue to do it. Even like big musicians that are touring, you know, giant rock bands like continue yeah. after you have kids it's it's a challenging thing to to continue you know you almost want to be like yeah I just well, want to go home and it also <laughs> you know depends on like what's happening at home and what you need to do and what your resources are like like you know my mother was a single she was a painter but she became a single mother with two girls in new york like she didn't she stopped painting you know and i i was aware that she stopped painting. Like we were aware that she stopped painting. And I think, you know, she tried to get back into it a little bit. I think part of it was that part of it was that she didn't, she, she had issues with the art world anyway. Like she didn't really like the art world, but I was aware that she stopped painting when she had kids, you know, like it, it got back burnered. I didn't want to do that. I also though wanted to be home with my kids and I was the primary care provider. And I also was really aware of the fact that it, I know it sounds funny to say something like this, like it's only 20 years, <laughs> but, but, but it's only 20 years. I mean, we're living to be what 80 and up 80 is no longer ancient. Yeah. Like my yeah. grandparents lived in most of them lived into their well no one of them lived to 97 we take 
really good care of ourselves as a generation. Medicine is advanced. We are going to live a long time unless we have a freak accident. Most of us, right? I hope Most of us. 97. Yeah, they were they were living off of like cigarettes and red meat and, you know. Exactly. Margarine. <laughs> you know. Asbestos and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Spam. Lead, All that stuff. Yeah. Lead paint and everything. Uh, yeah. So, so, so. I, it is really only 20 years. And when you think about our... Think, wait, so just so I can clarify what you mean by that. So the 20 years, you mean like from the time your kids are born until... Uh, this is what I'm assuming you're saying. Until they maybe get get their own apartment, they move out, that sort of until thing. Until they're grown. Yeah. Until they're grown. And they're only, you know... I think I actually think... Everybody, you know, there's, I mean, everybody's relationship to parenting and really like every family is so unique and it really has to be a right, whatever you do, it has to be the right fit for your group's temperament. There's not like a, this is how you do it. Yeah. And this is how you don't do it. For me, I really wanted to be there, you know, really like I didn't want to tour just a little bit. Like I'll go for two weeks in the summer. And knowing that they're having a blast with their dad and a grandparent. Mm. Okay. That's all right. That's like sending them off to summer camp, except I'm going off to work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, most of the time I like to be here. So I've, I've structured my music life around being home, yeah. but I mean, I can imagine it's very, very hard if you have to tour to make a living and you have the kids and they've got a life at school. Yeah. And like it, there's these layers of complication that that uh are you have to every parent has to find a relationship to it. I ha my relationship is I had a very hopping career. I had kids. I brought it all the way down to a slow simmer while I was raising children. You know, they they still need um, a lot of presents. They're going to be applying to college. They're navigating their next step. But I have more time now and more freedom. I can go out to a gig. They can be home alone. I'm not paying a babysitter. You know, so it's um it's it's always on on your mind and it's always a factor. But it changes as they get bigger. Yeah, you know? and I think too now the techno technological technological advances of like recording and, and all that sort of thing. You can do a lot of stuff remotely. Um, yeah. I find helps too. Cause I've got, you know, band members that are a couple of like maybe an hour and a half away. Uh, so sometimes recording and getting all of us into a room together would be really challenging. And me with kids, like I have my kids um, now, like every other week. And so, you know, when I have them, it's challenging for me to, I don't want to just leave them here and go do. Yeah. You know, music thing so either i'm having everyone come to me or we're doing some remote stuff or, or what have you and they're old enough now too like where where sometimes you know being kind of left alone and uh doing their own thing they prefer <laughs> over, yeah over me anyway. i think but. i think it's also important to like if you are a parent and you're a musician you have to you don't have to be surrounded by other parents or musicians you don't have to be surrounded by people who are not parents you have to be surrounded by people who understand that you are a parent because, you know, I was work doing some work with a group of musicians. None of them had kids and they were completely unsympathetic to the fact that they wanted to have, you know, rehearsals at 11 o'clock in Manhattan, which, is, which can be an hour and a half drive for me. I had young children. It was not easy for me. And when I would say things like that's not a good time for me, I was the only one saying that. And they were not sympathetic. I mean, that didn't last, basically, because it can't last. That's not. Meanwhile, if somebody tells me I'm old, my kids are old enough that I can, you know, be in the studio all day and they can cook their own dinner. It's not every night. They can do it one night while I'm working. Um, but if somebody says to me, I have a young child and I'm the primary care provider or I need to be home for my kid at a certain time, I'm going to watch that boundary for them with them and support them. 
you know, that, that you need to be home by this time. That means we need to be done by this time. I'm watching the clock for you with you and making sure we're as productive as we need to be during the time. And if what, even if we don't get to where we wanted to get production wise, your boundaries here, you got to leave. I'm not going to be like messing with that because you have your parent life and that's a big deal. What do your kids make food wise? What's their favorite? favorite dish oh. Do they have like <laughs> signature dish? I mean they make so many different things my daughter likes to bake this morning she uh she'll be 15 next month all right so and, our kids are, are similar age age wise so all right. 15 and 17 so yeah 15 13 well no 14 now 14. yeah 15 and 14. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. I mean, I think these last couple of years with my younger child have been, and both kids have been like big growth years. Like, like my son will be driving his, his birthday in, I'm in New Jersey and in New Jersey, you can get your license at 17. His birthday's in 10 days and he's going to take the test on his birthday. Itching to get out there. Huh? And he's going to get grandpa's old car. <laughs> so, oh, really? Awesome. Oh yeah. It's a 2006 Prius with 200,000 miles. I mean, it has no blue book value, but it'll be like so valuable. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Like I think that, that um, you know, the, the, the support that you get from the people around you, like you said, your, you know, your husband and your, you know, the, the, the people around, even your kids, you know, support what you're doing. Um, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things to continuing to do um, and, and pursue things that you love and being successful is having people around you that are supportive of you and that. that oh, for sure. Which you, of course, Monica, I, or Monica, so I'm sorry, I keep calling you Monica. That's okay. That's okay. Monica. Um, like I really, uh, you, you know, you had some support for me a while back and I, I really appreciate that. I just want to say thank you for that too. But oh I, my I, God. I, anytime. My yeah. pleasure. It's, Continue I think to, it's an yeah. honor when people ask you for support. It means they, fe they feel like they, you know, they feel like they can. And, and I'm so glad that you did ask cause it was, it's nice for me. Yeah. It was, it was a moment where I was like, Oh, what's, you know, what's uh, kind of what's going on is what I was thinking of at, at the time. And maybe I'll explain that on a future podcast, what happened, but uh, not today. I won't do it today. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> but, but I think like the support of people around you and having a team kind of around you, whether it be bandmates or a record label or just your family uh, that's around, you know, I had a comedian on uh, a few episodes back who said that, you know, his mom, when he, first decided um because i think the the art of comedy and the art of music very similar especially when you, you're yeah out. and so i talked a lot about like comedians and how they approach kind of their art and so i, I wanted to have a comedian we'll probably bring another one on uh, but he said his mom uh he had gone to her and said you know i want to pursue this uh as a career and she's like well i'll tell you what i will help you in any way i can to uh cover you if you're going to go into that full throttle um and yeah having that kind of so i see it in his eyes that he feels like he can do it simply because his mom said i got you if you you know if you pursue if you need me. yeah uh and, and it's so I, I feel like a lot of individuals don't have that that privilege or don't don't get the opportunity to do what they love uh or to pursue yeah really want to pursue simply because the support isn't there so thank you first of all for for you know the, the support that you, you you did give to me and i want to extend that to you as well and that's kind of why i want to oh, so uh, that's part of why i do this podcast i want to i want to have um whatever little resources i have to help you know promote these musicians that are out there maybe not you know maybe they have no one uh supporting what they're doing or whatever but i i see them and i i watch them and i listen to them and they're amazing yeah. artists and like if if no one else believes in them i believe in what they're doing um yeah and I think that that's that's probably my one contribution if you're out there and you're a family member of a an artist or someone creative uh, it can be very challenging to put your heart and soul into something that you know you release out into the world and there's you know critics that want to either hate it or love it or you don't know what's going to happen and uh to feel like you're alone in that i think is is uh, not acceptable <laughs> so i think it's, it's all of these things and i also have to say like it's a huge 
so you know in this right now it's in the time we find ourselves in i mean you can be uh the you know most brilliant artists in the world and you're still up against a, a business that has not that is not pay, like really fully paying for the art that you know you we, we have a mess with the with the streaming right now where um the royalties are not really a livable wage and people now that they've been getting all the world's music unlimited at their fingertips either for free or for nine dollars a month nobody's very few people i won't say nobody some people are but uh, very, very few people are like oh i should pay for this because it costs money to make so when you're supporting an artist in your household, you know, like my, I make now I'm make made my two albums this year. The one was released in August and the other one will be released in the summer next year. And then I'm making another album in May that will be released after that. So I have a sort of a cadence where one is being made while the other one's out. Uh, or coming at one's coming out and the other one's in the shoot, right? Um, it's not cheap. It's not cheap to make this art. And so it's a sacrifice. Like my family would have a lot more money if I wasn't an artist because I, and I, I emotionally have come to terms with the fact that I do this because I believe that it's my way of being a counterbalance to the harshness of the world, writing music that supports people is a service. But we are all out here doing this work, not getting paid really. And, you know, it, there's a truth to the fact that it's like a small M, capital A R T, small Y R, a martyr. I mean, we really are giving away our lives' works because it makes the world more beautiful. And um, it should be different, but that's where it is right now. And our, we don't have like the screenwriters ha and the um, the screenwriters had their had and the actors they have their unions that protect them and say, hey, look, you know, you're enjoying this TV show, you have to pay the writer. Musicians have no person, no organization doing that. Our unions are not doing that. So there's nobody really protecting us. We're at the um, whim of what the public wants and what the market has decided to do. The other piece, I think that's very hard to be not just us as the creators, but also the people who support us is that um, a, the way live music is right now, um, we have venues that, uh, many of which, most, I would say most of which do not want to pay for live music. And so you have musicians now, you know, perform, like people think that um, exposure is enough, which it's not because you cannot pay your rent with exposure books. You cannot buy your groceries with exposure books. Um, so it is a very hard time I mean, I think about this, you know, like I think about this also all the instruments, like the things we were talking about, strings, all the lessons, very, very, very expensive. I mean, I very it's very expensive over a sustained period of time. I mean, it, you know, anybody who's ever purchased a high quality instrument, like one that sounds very good at a professional level, it's not a small investment. And also, you know, if you're being a reasonable um, creator, you're paying paying the best you can for others. So you're really losing money yeah. in this effort. And the people who support you are losing the money too because you're not only not making a, like a contribution to your house, but you're spending your household's vacation money or whatever, new car money, on new records. Yeah. So I think that that's, I think it's all very complex and powerful. And um, I'm very thankful 
to have a family that understands that and accepts this and supports me and my happiness, but it's not, not super easy to do. It's not super easy to get. Not everybody has it. Um, so anyway, it's hard, it's hard out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I think like, like, you know, sometimes you put a project out there too, and you don't know, is it, is it going to be, you know, cause you kind of have to be, you have to set yourself up as a business too, in the same right. way, you know, you have to think of it as like, okay, yeah, I'm doing this project and yeah, it's a, a project of love and yes, I'm, I'm doing this, but there needs to be some, at least um, ethereal <laughs> out, out in the clouds way of, uh, it, it could make m its money back and it could, yeah. you know, but ultimately you're going into it, especially if you're doing it from an artist perspective where, you know, you're, you're doing a project where it's not a guaranteed sell. Like we were kind of talking about before, if you're making it specifically to be a TikTok thing and you're working, right. okay, how, how, how much 15 second little clips can I make to just make me money? That's a different way of making music than being an artist and, and actually uh, putting out a project that may be beautiful and it may be a, a wonderful piece of art, um, but you may not make any money. And, and, you know, being that your family was in, uh, the visual arts, you know, painters and that that sort of thing. Speaking of the art world, right. a lot of them, uh, most of those paintings aren't million dollar paintings until they're dead. You know, they, they well, live, right. You know, Van Gogh, right? You know his story, right? Art and being broke and 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 what yeah, his brother subsidized him. Like so, his brother, he he, I think he sold one painting in his life to his brother. <laughs> you know, it's like, and his brother, his brother, and uh, you know. His brother subsidized him and then his brother died. And so, and he died. So his sister-in-law, his like widowed sister-in-law with children was like, what's, what's up? I have a bunch of paintings and I have kids. Yeah. And so she is the one who made Van Gogh famous mm. because she was like, oh, I got paintings, you know, <laughs> like, but it's without her, who we would, we might never know who he was. And what, how insane is that? That's insane. And I think that's, that's where like, uh, you know, the, the team around you and the people around you are super important and who you surround yourself, you know, with. I think if you're in the company of people that um, don't don't have necessarily, they don't have to have the same vision as you, but can can accept that you have a vision maybe that of what you're doing that um, may not be easily recognizable to the market. Um, yeah doing what you know you you have a solid vision of what you want to put out and having people around you that understand or trust that you have a vision um yeah is important and and will help you continue and and i guess i'm gonna i think probably we'll wrap this up but i, I do want to have you back on um when you can because there's there's certain like business aspects of the music business too that yeah you no know, you're you know you've been a part of and i i've i'm you know, I've been steeped into that. I really want to talk about, yeah. Um, like for instance, BMI being bought out now um, by I don't yeah. know what the company is. That's that's I know, I'm a BMI. All my songs are registered with BMI. So I'm uh, thinking I'm asking. whether or not I should change that now. Um, but all that sort of stuff and and the you know the the uh, business behind it, I think, needs to be explained to new musicians that are coming into the. For sure. Yeah, know, there's a lot of working parts that like you you. I mean, yeah, there's one, a lot of work. Parts. It's like no one tells you about it, you know, and and, and I feel right. like even even successful musicians and, and artists almost keep it so close to the chest because they don't want anyone else to get a little piece of the pie that they've been able to attain. And so they, yeah. they want to gatekeep a little bit to keep out. Well, it's a scarcity. It's a scarcity um, mindset, which I mean, I get why people have it, because look like how much money is it? how much money is in the music business and who's getting it. I get it, but it's not my way. So I mean, I believe in sharing because I'm, I'm a high tide, all boats rise kind of thinker. Yeah. I like to see everybody, right. You know, but I also understand it years ago. A friend of mine was, we were talking about jazz specifically, and we're probably going back 20 years when he said this to me, but he, he was like, jazz is like a feeding frenzy, but there's no food. So everybody's eating each other. <laughs> and I was like, damn, that's harsh. He was like, no, but look around. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, can, I can see that being the case.
but so so let's end up kind of on a high note here because i'm gonna we'll 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 uh stop it here oh yeah that's a downer we'll, i'm sorry we'll have, a, we'll have a follow yeah i feel like we went we went kind of like into the into the deep end of the uh well i i love doing what i do and i do it because i love it and i you know i do it to lift people up and all that other stuff exists but it's not my focus yeah, I mean, there's there's challenges there, but but uh, I think uh, you know, especially you and I, um, you know, with with all the challenges that are out there, and a lot of our our kind of um, peers, if you will, uh, in the the indie music world, um, you know, if you continue kind of doing putting in the effort and, and putting in the work, you know, there's there are opportunities out there, and 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 I think that. I don't want to discourage uh, anyone from getting into the music business, but it is definitely a tough one. Um, it's no one's going to hand you anything anymore. Yeah, uh, there's not going to be some A and R rep that ever we're going to hand anybody anything. That's just oh, and just all of a sudden you're famous and you're you know you're you're I don't know who, who's a big one Taylor Swift or whatever like her and her. But team, she had to work for it too. Right, that's what I'm saying. They put in an enormous amount of work, and she is in and of herself, and you can see that now a business, you know. Um, yeah. And, and I think learning that side of it is super important, and it's difficult for creatives to want to get into the business side of it. You, you got to understand it. So I guess my my ending here would be: what piece of advice, if you had like kind of one thing to say to someone starting out either songwriting or getting into the music uh as you know as a profession i guess what would you say to them or, or a piece of advice you would give to them well i can i guess there's like a lot of pieces of advice but i would say one of the things that i try to ask myself before every project is what is the intention of the project you know, there's like different benchmarks for what, how you define success. Success is specific to each thing. Like if you say, I'm going to the store to get milk, when you go to the store and you get milk, you're successful. You could get other things, but your goal was milk, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you, if you know your intention for each project, hey, this project is for you know, to be played like this is supposed to be elevator music, grade A elevator music. It doesn't have to be anything else. It could be the best elevator music ever. That was your goal. And don't let anybody take you. You had a goal for that. If if it's this is to make people happy because they're sad, it doesn't matter if it has commercial success. If its goal is commercial success, then that is what you're focusing on and you're writing it for that. And if you keep those lines very clear and you're very clear about what means success, I think you'll always have it. You know, you just have to like, it's when people get like, start conflating things. Like it has to be the best artistic piece and it has to be the most success. Sometimes those things don't yeah. come together. Sometimes they do, but if you're very, very, clean and clear about what defining what success is for this and at first keep it very simple i just the success is going to the store and getting milk hmm. that's all you have to do do that make that a success build from there that would be my advice I, I think i can wholeheartedly agree with that and i think that um you know part of the reason why um you know i feel kind of you know a a, a connection with you Monique Elizabeth is, is is a little bit because of your um, ability to kind of see the see the the light in the like when when <laughs> there's when I write a piece of music right even though it's it, let's say it's a, a piece of music about something sad that's happened in my life I'm not looking at it as this is such a depressing part of my life and I want to share the depression of the thing i want to show how beautiful it is that we get to as human beings uh experience things like a sad moment and how beautiful that moment is and and i feel like um uh, your your attitude towards not only your art but but you know in general your life is is one of kind of seeing the uh the beautiful moments in all of that that stuff. And I think that, um, your positivity, you. you know, comes from that and, and I'm, I'm drawn to that. And so, um, you know, I, I continue to, uh, uh, to reach out to you cause I can, I can see that, that you're in that same, 
you know, that same mindset as I am, you know, uh, you come across a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, struggles and things in life and you can either take it as, um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, everything's against me or, or, yeah. or you can take it as, all right, this is another, another challenge. I'm grateful that I got the opportunity to, to try and push back against that, or I'm grateful that I even have the, the opportunity to, to experience whatever it is I've, I've just gone through because, um, you know, with the lottery of, of life and, and what have you, you may not have even, even gotten the opportunity to, to experience any of it. Um, and so, yeah. you know, I, I see your positivity and, and, uh, oh, thank you. So, um, if, if I can say anything to, to new songwriters, new musicians, all that would be, you know, just keep, keep going. And if you've got a, a, a good perspective and, you know, some people will say to you, you know, you should just, why don't you just stop doing that and become a, I don't know, a lawyer or something or, or do do something that's going to make you more money. Um, you know, I think there needs to be more people uh, and artists in the world that show the, the uh, amazing magnificence of human existence in all its form, oh, okay. uh, whether it be through art or, um, you know, music or, or performance or whatever that thing is. Uh, and, um, you know, I think we're going to need more of it in the, yeah. in the era of AI, which I actually like, I'm not, they're not going negative. Cause I actually think AI is pretty cool. Um, yeah. I don't think it replaces people. It's a tool, right? So if it went in, you know, it's like a hammer, it's a cool, cool, cool hammer, yeah. <laughs> um, but we're going to need more humanity. What as that, starts showing up more like the art is needed it's actually needed yeah i think especially now um you know we need more uh you know more more human beings um uh, just expressing that without um you know without thinking about uh how weird it is to do that sort of thing because we're all we're <laughs> um, yeah, you know, yeah. doing it and, and and i i feel like uh uh, I gravitate also towards those those type of people, um, you know, letting their their kind of inner weirdo shine. <laughs> uh, afraid to be a weirdo because the 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 greatest people in the world that that have existed, like Picasso, uh, right. were broke during their their time doing it, and uh, ended up you know giving humanity the some of the greatest uh, gifts that can be given. So, uh, Monica, let's do this. Let's give another shameless plug of where people can find your stuff. Um, oh, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> give it to uh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, my, I have everything up on MonicaRyan.com. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-R-Y-A-N.com. And uh, I'm on Facebook as Monica Ryan Music. And I'm on Instagram as Monica Ryan Music. And uh, come and join the conversation. Join my mailing list. I write blogs about creative process, um, and they'll come right to your inbox. Not every week, um, but fairly regularly. <laughs> all right. So everybody go go follow uh, Monica on all her platforms. Go download her music because uh, actually downloading it does help, especially on like iTunes. I tell everyone, like, go actually oh, download yeah. You get paid a little bit more when that happens. I'm getting phone calls over here in the in the background too. But uh, before I go, I need to do the shameless plug too. Go down yes. and subscribe, like, comment, do all the like. Uh, tell your friends about us. Share it. We have got merch now. I finally put out a, a link to the merch that took me 15 episodes to create. Uh, but it's finally out there. I don't have a lot. and There's, there's more coming uh, for Christmas um uh go go purchase that although this this episode will probably come out after the new year so happy new year uh to everyone who's watching that and uh we'll see you on the next episode monica thank you so much for being on the show and uh um, maybe i'll see you in la or is that you're not not going this year no right? my daughter has a big concert in philadelphia and, and so, much better than some of the Grammy stuff that'll be happening anyway. <laughs> I, I mean, I would honestly, they both sound great to me, but now I'd like, you know, now I don't have to choose because, you know, I wasn't nominated. <laughs> if I was nominated, I would have a, a tough see. choice. Yeah, I would go do. to LA, but I would miss my daughter's big concert at the yeah. Kimmel Center. And that would be sad. So <laughs> now I get to be happy about going to Kimmel Center and not missing yeah. it. Is it is it after uh, Jimmy Kimmel? Is that what it's named after? What is it? No. 
No, I don't know what it's named after, but it, um, uh, yeah, probably a family. It's probably a family name, but I don't know. Uh, it's beautiful, though. It's a beautiful. Well, you said in Philly? Uh, it's in Philadelphia. It's in downtown Philadelphia. It's like the premier music hall. That's awesome that she gets to perform. There, there. You know, it's a great. I love, this is a whole other conversation. I love the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra. I love it. We they should do, do a great job. But you know what I should do on this podcast? I should have a like, oh, continue to be a, a, pat a patron, and then you can see the rest of this conversation. We should do that whole thing that every other podcast. <laughs> I know. We could like, probably talk for like 10 hours. You yeah, know. you got like a paywall in front of it. I agree. <laughs> I agree. We could, we could talk for a long time. But uh, we'll, we'll cut it here. We'll have you back on. Maybe in six months, AI right. will have, have taken over the world, and we'll be all... Okay. Uh, you know, we'll be all digitized and whatever on the podcast. No, it won't happen because, as we said, the world needs people being real people. That's and right. we're going to do that forever and ever. <laughs> That's right. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Happy New Year, because uh, I believe, I hope so, it'll be out after the New Year, I think. Um, so Happy New Year. And, uh, uh, again, thank you, everyone, for watching and to our sponsors, uh, Lucky Buzz and uh, Seed and Stone Cidery. And we'll see you on the next one, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop this. And give me a second here. I got to stop.